Good afternoon. My name is Sarah Grant and I represent the City and County of Broomfield and I'm the chair of the Dr. Cog Transportation Advisory Committee. I call to order the October 28th, 2024 Dr. Cog TAC meeting at 1.30 p.m. This is an in-person live stream meeting format and members of the public attending by Zoom have the ability to mute and unmute themselves and share their webcam. For those attending online, please make sure that your typed name reflects your name and your first and last name and representation. We ask that those intending to speak to use the raise hand button to ask a question or comment on an agenda item. If you have any technical questions, you can direct them to staff in a chat box. As a reminder to members and alternates here in person, please press the unmute button on the bottom of your mic stand and be sure your, mic, your light on your microphone is on and you're prepared to speak and speak directly into the microphone so your voice will amplify. Please announce your name and representation when asking a question or making a comment for the record. During the business agenda, TAC members and alternates can speak or ask questions. Members of the public may speak during public comments. Dr. Cog is sending around the sign-in sheet and please sign in. And at this time, we will start with introductions of TAC members and alternates here in person. And we'll start with Carson. Carson Priest, TDM Special Interest Seat. Brody Ayers, Aviation Special Interest Seat. Maria DeAndre, City of Wheat Ridge. Mike Whitaker, Jefferson County, Lakewood. Christina Lane, Jefferson County. Brent Sutherland, uh, Raffo County and Littleton. Jeff Tankbringer, Raffo County and the City of Centennial. Michelle Riccio, Adams County. Kent Mormon, Adams County, City of Thornton. Good afternoon, Matt Callison, City of Aurora, Arapahoe County. Michelle Milanakis, City of Lafayette, Boulder County. Jeff Boyd, Housing Interests. Hi, Frank Bruno, Via Mobility Services. Jenna Hahn, Adams County and City of Commerce City. Cam Kennedy, Dr. Cog Staff. Sarah Grant, City and County of Broomfield. Jacob Rieger, Dr. Cog Staff. Andrew Rivera, Mall, PID Special Equity Seat. Jessica Michaelbus, CDOT. Jennifer Hill House, City and County of Denver. I'm Ryan Douglas County and County Council Rock. Zeke Lynch, Douglas County. Chris Quinn with RTD. David Kretzinger, Denver. Good afternoon, Doug Rex, Dr. Cog. Alex Hyderite, Boulder County. Carolyn Clam, Dr. Cog. Jim Eusen, Region 4, CDOT. Uh, David Gasper, City and County of Denver. Thank you. Uh, usually at this time we have uh, any membership updates, but we do not have any membership updates this month. Next will be public comment. Now we'll open up the meeting for public comment. Comment is limited to three minutes. If you've joined by Zoom, please raise your hand by pressing the raise hand button and we will call on you to begin speaking. If you have joined by phone, please raise your virtual hand by pressing star nine and we'll call on you by the last three digits of your phone number. Staff will unmute you and then you will need to unmute yourself by pressing star six on your phone. You will have three minutes to speak after which we will ask you to wrap up and your line will be muted. As a reminder, after public comment, only TAC members and alternates will partake in the discussion regarding each agenda. Do we have any public comment here in person today? Seeing none, do we have any public comment online? Seeing no one in person or online, uh, we will close the, comment, the public comment period. At this time, we'll move on to the meeting summary of the August 26, 2024 uh, TAC meeting summary. Is there any discussion, corrections, or questions about the August 26, 2024 TAC meeting? Seeing none, the summary will stand as presented. Thanks. We'll move on to our first of two action items. The uh, first is item number four, the fiscal year 2024 to 2027 transportation improvement program amendments. This is attachment B in your packet. And at this time, we'll hand it over to Josh Wink, Dr. Cox, Senior Planner. Thank you, Chair. So the first of our amendments uh, 
this afternoon is a change to the CDOT region for surface treatment pool. We are adding three new projects to that pool worth a total of $10,030,000 in surface treatment funding, as well as an additional $1,761,000 in state cost escalation funds. One of those three projects uh, for State Highway 7 is also receiving an additional $2 million in state ADA funding. So that is being added into the Region 4 ADA pool, the next project on the list. Next, we have two federal discretionary grant awards. The first is $10.8 million in, from the federal uh, PROTECT program, which is going to the City of Aurora for the Box Elder Creek Erosion and Flood Control Project and then $32 million from the Federal Safe Streets and Roads for All, or SS4A program, going to the city of Boulder. Happy to take any questions about any of those. Otherwise, there is a proposed recommendation available for you here in your packet. Thank you, Josh. Are there any questions or comments for Josh? Uh, yeah, got your I'm sorry, did you say $32 million? Um, for the city of Boulder instead of $23 million. That's what I thought I heard. I'm sorry. that I may have misspoke. That is 20... Oh. Okay. <laughs> um, it should be $23,032,000. I may have misspoke. Sorry about that. Thank you. Any further questions or comments for Josh Wayne? We will entertain a, a motion. At Mormon. Yeah, I, I move to recommend to the Regional Transportation Committee the attached project amendment to the fiscal year 24-27 Transportation Improvement Program. Second. Sorry, right, that second was uh, Maria DeAndrea. Thank you. Uh, we have a motion and a second. Is there any further discussion? All in favor say aye. Aye. Any opposed? Extensions. Passes unanimously. Thank you. Thank you. The next item on the agenda is um, the active transportation improvement set aside policy attachment C. And Josh Frank, senior planner, will present this. Thank you. Um, so as a reminder, back in August, um, we brought a set of potential changes to the Transportation Improvement Program set-aside policies to this group for discussion. Um, we are bringing those changes back to you today for action. Um, the changes are identical to what was discussed back in August with uh, two small changes, which I'll cover, uh, but I'll run through an overview of all of the changes for you first. Um, so there are several changes um, for just to start out. Um, we've added formal revision procedures for this policy. But, so before those were not stated, but we have added um, actual procedures for carrying through a amendment or an administrative staff led modification to this policy. Uh, we've also updated the eligibility criteria uh, for two of the set-asides for the Regional Transportation Operations and Technology and Community-Based Transportation Planning set-asides. Uh, we've changed uh, some of the scoring criteria for two of the set-asides, our Transportation Demand Management and Community-Based Transportation Planning, as well as rebalancing some weighting between uh, different scoring criteria on three of those set-aside programs. So our transportation demand management, RTO and T, and community-based transportation planning. For our uh, human service transportation set aside, we have just reflected the language within that set aside to reflect some new funding sources rather than just the state faster funding that they had received previously uh, to reflect that they are now receiving both federal CMAC as well as state uh, MMOF funding. Um, for each of our four new uh, set-asides, we've also uh, changed the match language to reflect that those are now receiving um, state toll credits, so there is no match requirement for any of those four uh, set-aside programs. 
on the innovative mobility set aside program. We have also just updated that language when the policy was originally written. Uh, we intended to use a hybrid approach where some funding would be distributed directly to local agencies while some would be retained for by Dr. Cog. Um, that was a fairly complex uh, proposal, so we have updated that language uh, to remove the reference to that hybrid model. Uh, finally, just throughout all of the set-aside programs, we've also just added some flexibility to the website section, noting that we now have uh, state accessibility requirements, just leaving some flexibility as far as what has to be posted to the website um, for each of those. Um, following the discussion in August, uh, there had been several um, comments made uh, by members of the committee, so we did make some additional small changes. So for our transportation demand management program, um, there's a clarification of the urban center criterion. So that had been um, in the policy as more of a quantitative analysis. Um, that was changed to more of a qualitative analysis for the committee to consider um, rather than just running the numbers. Um, as well as on the regional transportation operations and technology program, uh, there was uh, some wording around a suggested minimum uh, request of 100,000. Uh, that word suggested was just removed uh, to clarify that the minimum request requirement is 100,000. Um, there was also a question on the RTO and T project uh, around the removal of the word technology in the eligibility criteria. Um, technology is still eligible for this program. The change there was just uh, to make the eligibility criteria um, reflect the federal definition in regulations of the term operational improvement, um, but transportation technology is included within that federal definition. Um, so no change was made there, um, but there is no change to eligibility for that program. Um, so happy to take any questions, comments about this. Otherwise, again, I do have a proposed uh, motion available for you in your packet. Thank you, Josh. Uh, are there any questions or comments for Dr. Cog? And thank you, Josh, for the um, overview and uh, bringing this to us in August, as well as covering all the questions that we had. Brian Weimer? Uh, I propose a motion, and that would be to move to recommend to the Regional Transportation Committee, RTC, the attached amendments to the policy for the 2024-2027 Transportation Improvement Program set-aside programs. Brian, is there a second? Tom Reeves? Tom provides a second. Any further discussion? All in favor, say aye. Aye. Opposed? Abstentions. That is unanimously. Thank you, Josh. Thank you. That concludes our action items for today. We will now move on to the discussion items section of the agenda. This is item number six, the public engagement plan update, attachment D in your packet. Kelsey Farrar Jones, public engagement planner for Dr. Cog, will present this item. Thank you, Chair. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. I'm Kelsey Forfar Jones, the Public Engagement Planner here at Dr. Cog, um, and leading the update to the Public Engagement Plan. Uh, we're about halfway through the process and wanted to share with you all um, what we've done so far, where we're at, and where we're headed. So just a, a brief overview of what the Public Engagement Plan is. For the public, this is a great resource for understanding Dr. Cog's public, or sorry, engagement and planning processes, as well as how to best get involved with us. Um, there's great information uh, related to Dr. Cog's public engagement philosophy. So if anyone's wondering how we lead engagement, this plan goes through that where, why, how, what um, for our engagement. Uh, the plan also has information on the best ways to get involved with us. If someone is wanting to uh, provide input with Dr. Cog, then this plan will um, show them the best way to do that. 
And then Dr. Cog's policy process. So how policy moves from our committees um, to board for adoption um, might not, or might be a given for um, everyone in this room, but it's not necessarily for the public. So the plan uh, gives more information on that. Uh, this plan is also a great resource for staff. It has information related to Dr. Cog policy. More specifically, our public engagement principles, uh, which lead all of engagement here at Dr. Cog, and we'll go more into that in a second. Uh, legal requirements, some plans have specific requirements, such as uh, public hearings and public comment periods. So there's information in the plan on when that's necessary and how to go through that process. And then finally, strategies and tips for success. The plan has a lot of information on public engagement strategies, techniques, tools, uh, potential partners, um, and things like that. So Dr. Cog's engagement principles, like I said, these principles really guide all of our engagement here at Dr. Cog. Um, so I wanted to share those with you. The first two, early and ongoing engagement, timely and adequate notice of when we're requesting engagement, consistent access to necessary and useful information, public review and comment on plans, consideration of perspectives from disadvantaged communities, and regular review of the public engagement process. So why are we updating the plan? Um, partially because of that last principle, um, but also because the plan hasn't been updated since 2019 and a lot has changed since then. Um, we have some new plans and programs um, that we'd like to include in the plan. And then we're always striving to make Dr. Cog's engagement better and to expand our reach. So what exactly is changing in the plan? Uh, there will be new information on virtual engagement strategies, piloted innovative public engagement strategies, techniques and requirements for regional planners and AAA staff, and then revisions to make the plan document more readable and usable. So starting with that first one, virtual public engagement strategies, uh, like I had previously mentioned, this plan hasn't been updated since 2019, and um, that doesn't take into consideration the COVID pandemic. Um, and as we all know, engagement has really changed since then. Um, and although we're able to uh, do in-person engagement again, we found that the best way to reach everyone is to do um, both in-person and virtual. Oh, sorry. I'm going to not put my hand over there. <laughs> um, both in-person and virtual engagement. Um, and so some of those strategies that we've incorporated, um, virtual public meetings, as well as our social pinpoint site, which is our virtual hub uh, for all of our projects with um, public engagement or any public facing information. Um, and if you haven't checked out our social pinpoint site yet, I highly recommend doing it. Uh, there's a lot of great information on there um, with current projects as well as some of, some of our recently finished projects. Piloted and innovative public engagement strategies. Uh, our sub-area planning team has really been um, piloting quite a few of these engagement strategies, and so we want to incorporate those in the plan. Um, and some of those strategies include compensation for focus groups, food at public meetings, and transit passes for attendees. Um, so we'll be including those strategies as well as some of the lessons learned from these pilots in the plan. Techniques and requirements for RPD and AAA. Uh, both our regional planning and development team as well as um, our area agency on aging um, have their own plans with specific requirements. And so we want to make sure that we um, capture those in the plan. Currently, the plan has uh, quite a bit of information for um, our transportation requirements, but um, we want to make sure that we're incorporating both RPD and AAA as well. Um, so any requirements as well as any techniques or strategies that they find most useful. So schedule for this uh, update. Um, like, I, like I previously mentioned, we're about halfway through 
Uh, we started in June with document development and we anticipate ending uh, by the end of this month. And then having um, our final uh, document ready by mid-March um, and then on to you all as well as RTC and board for adoption. So where we're at now and next steps, uh, we recently finished some workshops with um, key Dr. Cog staff, asking them how they currently use the plan, what would make the plan um, more or a better resource for them, um, which engagement strategies and techniques do they use most, and so we'll incorporate that feedback uh, into the plan. We're also uh, holding some meeting, meetings with um, some of our regional partners, and so we, we're, we're trying to figure out what they do for engagement um, so that we are ensuring that we are doing the best we can. So we'll incorporate that information as well. And then um, once we're done with our first draft, we will uh, ask um, staff for revisions and we'll incorporate their revisions into the plan. And then we will have a public comment period where we do the same with the public. Um, and then we will have um, our final document. So that's it for me. Um, happy to answer any questions anyone might have. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Kelsey. Really happy to see Dr. Cog um, incorporating best practices in vir virtual engagement as well as piloting innovative public engagement strategies. This is really any uh, questions or comments from staff? Uh, Kent Mormon. Just a question. You you talk about the regional transportation planning and the uh, AAA. You're standing up a new area for decarbonization. Are you going to incorporate that into this document or will it be a separate document for public engagement? Um, that is a good question. I believe that we are we will be incorporating um, some of that into our plan, but um, I and I don't know if <laughs> anyone yes, thanks, Jacob. Yeah, I'll help with that question. It's a really good question. Um, so I think a couple of things. Uh, as part of the de decarbonized Dr. Cog and as part of the climate pollution reduction grant, you know, certainly as they undertake their processes, they will incorporate um, engagement into that work as, as appropriate. I, I think the larger sort of point here is that our public engagement plan is meant to be sort of universal, but anytime we undertake a major project, and I'll use the 2050 Regional Transportation Plan as an example, we will actually develop an engagement plan specific to the 2050 RTP. So the public engagement plan that we're updating is meant to be more of that toolkit or that kind of guidebook for how we do public engagement, but we will tailor it and customize it to um, specific efforts as you suggest. Does that answer your question, Kent? Yes, thank you. Brian Weimer. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I'm curious how this plan is integrating with your Title VI plan, and what steps are you taking to have that occur? Yeah, I'm, and I'm not sure, Alvin, if you might be able to assist me with this question. Um, Alvin um, was leading the update to the Title VI plan. <laughs> Yeah, um, I think while not like an official part of our non-discrimination program here at Dr. Cog, it's a key piece of how we work with marginalized communities. One of the updates that we're doing through the public engagement plan is making sure our language is consistent across all these different plans. So one, one of those is just shifting to marginalized communities, um, taking advantage of the translation policy we now have here at Dr. Cog that has been in place for a couple of years. We want to make sure that's shown in a number of our different plans. So we mentioned it in Title VI. We want to make sure we note it here in our public engagement plan. So I think where it's appropriate to uh, be touching on multiple subjects simultaneously, we do, um, but we want to make sure that the focus for this one really is maybe a little more public facing than what our Title VI plan or our, the remainder of our non-discrimination program is. Additional questions or comments? Seeing none, thank you, Kelsey. Thank you for that thorough update. Thank Look you. Look forward to seeing uh, future updates on the plan. Next up is item number seven. This is the Dr. Cog Crash Data Dashboard Demonstration. This is attachment E in your packet. And Greg Conant, Senior Geographic Information System Analyst, will be presenting this item.
Hello, my name is Greg Conant. I'm a senior GIS analyst on the GIS team here at Dr. Cog and was one of the developers for our new crash data dashboard, which we just released in August. Uh, before I get in, I want to note that uh, crash data can be kind of a sensitive subject, and we just like to acknowledge that every data point in this dashboard uh, reflects one or more human lives impacted by a crash. So reminding us that behind all, those, all of these statistics are real people and real communities. So I want to cover a little bit of the background about the crash data dashboard, uh, why we felt the need to produce a product, since there are some similar products in the state, and uh, like, for example, CDOT has their own crash data dashboard, um, and then do a very brief demo about the dashboard itself to kind of orient you guys to what it looks like, and then hopefully you or your staff can go in and uh, pull some meaningful information out of it. So the development team for the dashboard, uh, we went into the project very intentionally wanting to know what our motivations were for creating this dashboard and then having some clear and concrete objectives that would come from those motivations. So uh, some of the motivations guiding us to uh, decide we wanted to create a dashboard, including meeting a need for regional tools and prepackaged analysis. So we recognize that not everyone has the GIS skills or the uh, spatial data science skills required to really pull meaningful insight out of the often very complicated crash data. So we wanted kind of a one-stop shop that everyone from the general public to like a high-level urban planner could go in and really pull some meaningful information and some of the trends of crash data in the region. Uh, we also recognize that there is a continuing safety crisis when it comes to transportation and crashes in the region. Uh, obviously, Dr. Cog is all in on the Regional Vision Zero program, and great strides have been made, but there's still a long way to go. And so we see this dashboard as kind of fitting in as yet another tool to try and tackle that issue. And finally, uh, last motivation for us was just being able to leverage growing Dr. Cog capacity. We brought a few new members onto the team and really expanded our pool of data expertise, so we wanted to leverage that with a new product. And uh, the specific objectives we made sure we wanted to meet uh, by the end of this project were directly related to the motivations. So providing easy access into insights from the crash data, as I mentioned, we just want this to be an accessible way for people to really dive into data that they wouldn't normally have access to. Uh, providing a central location so you can compare apples to apples when you're looking from one jurisdiction to another, one county to another, uh, being able to have a kind of single source of information. And finally, as I just mentioned, uh, spurring more actions to achieve regional vision zero. Uh, there's no one tool or one method that's going to get us to that goal of zero traffic-related fatalities. So we see this dashboard as just yet another tool in the toolbox to try and achieve that. Uh, briefly go over the data source of the crash data. Uh, for those of you who don't know, the data goes on quite the journey from beginning to end, uh, starting with uh, the data collection, which is done live on the scene of an accident from law enforcement. Uh, they enter it into a software system, which is then transmitted to the Colorado Department of Revenue for record retention. And then it's passed to CDOT, the Colorado Department of Transportation. And from there, CDOT then sends it out to various jurisdictions or municipalities, including us at Dr. Cog. Uh, CDOT does some preliminary processing of the data, uh, and then after we receive it in-house here, we continue to further process and further improve the um, accuracy and the quality of the data. And I also want to mention that the dashboard currently has a rolling five-year window for the crash data. So we do not have all of the crash data going back, you know, to 2010 or whatever. Um, so we currently have 2018 to 2022, which is the most recent CDOT crash data. And we will be updating that annually, uh, rolling the five-year window forward to make sure everything is very consistent and applicable. Uh, real briefly, the crash data extent that you will see in the dashboard uh, covers this area. So this boundary is what we call the Dr. Cog modeling boundary. And this is where we clip all of our spatial data down to. And this is the region that will be covered in the dashboard. 
Um, as you can see, huge variety of regions, everything from the Denver metro region to the more rural eastern plains and the foothills and mountains. So as I mentioned, CDOT does a little of the preliminary data processing in, on their end, and then they pass it out to various jurisdictions. Uh, once we receive it, we then further um, process the data. So we do some geolocating, which means uh, placing the points in a spatial way on a map, um, and specifically geolocating the records that have not been already geolocated by CDOT on their road network system. Uh, another big processing step we do is cleaning the address field. So as I mentioned, this data is collected live at the scene of an accident. And as you might imagine, there can be a lot of spelling mistakes or things like abbreviations can really throw off the spatial data accuracy since we are geolocating based on addresses a lot of the time. And then a exciting new development for the data on our end, we are now snapping all of the crash data to a, um, to a road network system, an LRS. And so we started that with the most recent data we have in the dashboard, the 2022 year data, and we'll be doing that moving forward. So as that five-year rolling window moves forward, we will continue snapping the data to the road network, and that should really help to improve the spatial data accuracy. And then finally, um, there is a lot of data in the dashboard. We currently have 308,000 records. And so unfortunately, we cannot go through record by record and double check accuracy. Uh, however, there are certain records that we feel are more important um, than others, and those include fatal injury crashes, serious injury crashes, or non-motorist crash locations, so crashes involving pedestrians or bicyclists or the like. Uh, we do go through and manually check each of those records for spatial data accuracy as well as attribute accuracy. So going into this project, Dr. Cog wanted to be very intentional with the way we started the project. Um, we didn't want to create a product, uh, product just for ourselves and then send it out for review and try and incorporate all the feedback we received in kind of an iterative way. So we knew we wanted to go in and engage stakeholders very early on in the process so that we were really building a product for the users, not for ourselves. So this started way back in winter 2024, back in January, and we started with internal discussions within the development team about what the objectives that I covered earlier would be for the project, as well as what our audience, or who our audience would be. Uh, and from there, we moved on to software and data assessment. So one, we had to decide how much data do we want to include, and that's where the decision for the five-year rolling window came from. And we also wanted to decide which platform we could build a dashboard on. There are various different options available to us, and you know all of them have pros and cons, so we had to settle on something that would meet the most needs for the most people. And finally, we used these internal discussions as a guide for approaching internal and external stakeholders. So the stakeholder engagement started in spring of 2024. Uh, we started with a round of internal engagement, so we contacted the transportation division, the regional planning division, as well as our way to go uh, transportation team, and asked for feedback, asked for um, kind of wish list items they would like to see, how a dashboard could fit into their existing workflows, et cetera. And from there, we then moved on to external engagement. So we um, engaged both the Regional Vision Zero Working Group as well as the Denver Regional Crash Data Consortium, asking a lot of the similar questions. How would this how would a new dashboard work into your existing workflows? Uh, what would you like to see in a dashboard? And we really uh, went for a pie in the sky approach. We wanted people to give us their most desired items and didn't pay any attention to whether or not it would be possible or not. Um, that came down the road, but we just wanted people to throw suggestions at us. And uh, since we did get a lot of suggestions thrown at us, we kind of had to synthesize all that down. And so we developed some common themes that came up and kind of assessed uh, which comments came up most regularly um, and tried to prioritize uh, which of these comments or which of these desired items would be possible from a technical standpoint. 
So from there, we built our first draft and solicited um, further input from stakeholders. So we came back to these uh, similar internal and external groups with the first draft, explained how some of the initial feedback was worked into the first draft, and then from there iterated uh, even more changes for the dashboard, which we then incorporated and finally launched in August. Uh, just to quickly cover some of the themes that came up from the stakeholder engagement. Internally, we heard some themes such as filtering by custom areas, so even more than just a specific town, municipality, or county, um, people wanted to be able to filter down to a specific road corridor or a neighborhood. Uh, in addition, being able to identify top intersections, which intersections in the region have the most crashes. Also, understanding trends and crash types and severity. So uh, were, were the most crashes involving left turns at a light or a rear end? Uh, and then severity as well, so the fatal or serious injury crashes. And then also understanding trends in bike and pedestrian crashes or otherwise vulnerable road users. And then externally, um, we actually heard all the same themes as the internal ones, in addition to ensuring accuracy of the data. Uh, historically, the crash data has had some data accuracy issues just because it is such complex data that is collected in a not ideal environment. Um, and then quickly identifying hotspots as well was important to a lot of people, being able to tell where more crashes were happening versus fewer in order to allocate uh, certain planning projects and funding to have the most, um, have the most effect. Uh, also comparing crash types and trends in different parts of the region, so maybe comparing different municipalities or even just um, comparing where a transportation improvement project might have gone in seeing what the effect was over time before and after the project went, went in. So uh, to meet a lot of these requires, uh, requirements or suggested features that stakeholders wanted to see, uh, we came up with two main features of the dashboard, and those include attribute filters and themed tabs. So the attribute filters, uh, we made a decision to try and include as many attribute filters as possible, even though it was uh, making the dashboard itself a little more complex. We really wanted to give power to the users to dig down into the data as much as they could or as much as they needed to. And then the theme tabs is kind of the structure of our dashboard. I'll show you in a moment in the demo. Um, but we had so many different charts and metrics that we wanted to show and just didn't have the screen real estate to show at all. So we kind of bucketed each into a themed tab. So for example, the where tab includes all the geography of crash data and plotting it on a map. Um, the when tab includes all of the temporal trends, so tracking crash data across the years or months. Now I'm gonna jump over to the demo. So this is the dashboard. This is the initial splash screen that you'll see when you uh, enter the dashboard. It's got a few resources um, as well as some disclaimers. And then clicking the enter the dashboard, we'll find the main landing page. Um, the dashboard will always open on this where tab to start. You can see those bucketed tabs I was talking about down at the bottom of the screen here. And over on the left side is the bar of attribute selectors. So this is the way you can really filter all of the data. Um, so you can see everything from the year, county, uh, severity of the crash, things like road condition or weather condition. It goes pretty deep, and all of these can be used in conjunction with each other or alone to really allow you to drill down as much as you need to. Uh, also on this page are a top intersections list. That was a big thing that came up in our stakeholder engagement. And then three indicators on the right, just kind of showing general metrics for what you're actively seeing. Uh, I'm not going to go too deeply into any of these specific tabs. Um, I really encourage you or your uh, organization to jump in and dig in there. Uh, but I do want to note that each of these filters will apply to any of the dashboard elements. So for example, if I were to choose a county, I'm just going to, not picking on Adam specifically, but top of the list, uh, you'll see that the intersections chart on the right has updated to include data for just Adams County. And this is going to apply to any of the charts in the dashboard. 
So this is the WEN tab that I just mentioned, tracking temporal trends. And since I still have that county filter added, uh, these are the temporal trends specifically for Adams County crashes. And if I reset that selector, you'll see that everything updates and these are now the temporal trends for the whole region. I'll quickly go through these. The Y tab includes uh, some environmental or uh, conditions at the time of a crash, things like lighting conditions or weather conditions. How tab can include things like uh, actions or vehicle movements related to a crash. The who tab involves people or groups of people involved in crashes. Um, we have things like the crash age range bar chart, which tracks ages of any participant in the crash, not necessarily a driver. And then we also wanted to be very intentional with a focus on vulnerable road users and picking out some of the crash uh, trends for those. So this whole tab is uh, reusing some of the charts on other tabs. However, it's pre-filtered to include uh, data only for vulnerable road users, which are pedestrians, bicyclists, or equivalent such as scooter riders. And lastly, we do have an About tab. There's a lot of documentation here, uh, two different scrolling panes that include all the tools, all the workflows you might expect to do, um, as well as uh, lots of supplemental information such as descriptions of the data that's, that are included or descriptions of the selectors as well. And briefly, I just want to point out that there are several tools on the map section of the dashboard as well. You can see these buttons in the upper uh, bar of the map. These include things like a base map gallery. You can switch out the base map. There is a legend, as well as various, various layer lists. Uh, while we're here, I want to note that when you're at a regional zoom level, such as we are here, uh, the crash data is bucketed into aggregated bins or these blue rectangles. Oops. And so you can see that the areas of darker blue are areas where there were more crashes and lighter blue, fewer crashes. And as you zoom in, you will start to see individual crash points appear. You'll see that the symbology kind of points out the severity and type of crash. So the larger red icons indicate fatal crashes, medium-sized orange icons are serious injury crashes, and the smaller gray icons uh, indicate crashes where there were no fatalities or serious injuries. And all of this information will be in the legend as well. And the final tool I want to point out is we got some feedback that uh, people wanted to be able to draw custom geographies. And while we don't have a way to upload a shape file of a boundary or anything like that, we do have a custom selection tool. So say you were interested in a certain intersection or road corridor, you could use this selection tool to click and drag around some points and select them. And then the entire dashboard will update to only include the metrics for those points you just selected. And that's the dashboard in a nutshell. Again, we really encourage people to go in and play around with it and um, are always looking for feedback about new uh, additions we can make to the dashboard and have a few plans for ourselves already as well. I just want to hop, hop back to the slides real quick. This is always a fun section for uh, your own projects going forward. Uh, lessons we learned, trial by tribulation, right? So we decided to engage with stakeholders early in the process, and uh, we found that that was an excellent strategy, um, not just for this dashboard pro project, but really any project. It's very important to incorporate that stakeholder feedback early so that you're not going down a dead end road and having to fix things afterward. Uh, we also learned that data cleaning was the most time intensive task. So developing the dashboard itself was actually a uh, much smaller piece of the pie compared to the actual geoprocessing attribute updating of the crash data itself. It is quite complex and uh, there was a lot of wrangling needed to get it into a clean form for the dashboard. Uh, another one, uh, some desi design decisions have no right or wrong answer and you will have to just at some point make a decision that could go either way. 
Uh, for example, one of these for us was, do we want to build in more features but have a more complex and a bit slower dashboard or keep it a little simpler and have it be snappy and easy to get into? And we ultimately decided to add more features. We wanted it to be a really robust data product that people could learn to use over time versus um, just having people be able to jump in it very quickly. Uh, but not be able to garner as many insights into the data. Uh, exposing data on a granular scale highlights errors and inconsistencies. Uh, that is one disclaimer we need to make is there are still errors and inconsistencies in the data. Like I said, we were not able to check every single 300,000 plus records manually. So as you uh, zoom around, pan around the dashboard, you may see some odd data. Um, all spatial data accuracy will continue to improve as we roll forward, uh, but there are still a few outliers here and there. And then finally, the public perception about the subject matter. There were several points where we kind of had to check ourselves because we were really excited about this dashboard. We were excited to get it out, uh, wrote some engagement language, uh, asking people for, you know, what were their especially desired uh, workflows within the dashboard and excited to be able to get them out to the uh, users, but we had to really remind ourselves that crash data is kind of a sensitive subject for some people, and it's important to keep that in mind and not, um, not be too in the weeds of your own uh, project development and be really aware of how users or your external stakeholders are going to see your project and product. So next steps, as I mentioned, we have a few updates planned, uh, most likely for next year, but we will be updating the data annually and rolling that five-year window forward and are always looking for feedback about design or functionality updates. And that's it, thank you. Thank you, Greg, thank you for that overview. Any questions or comments for COG staff? David. Um, thank you for the presentation. One of the questions I had is, is there a way to query by facility type? Um, so we do have uh, road location descriptions, so they can include things like at a driveway or at an intersection. Uh, however, we do not have specifically like a highway versus a rural access road or anything like that. Um, that is something that we are looking to incorporate into the data. And it's just a matter of determining whether it's available as an attribute in the base data. Thank you. Brian Weimer. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, are you looking at CRAS modification factors as maybe the next step in terms of what you're looking at, i.e. you have certain types of crashes on a corridor, uh, what that modification uh, that you propose and what the benefit that you would gain out of it uh, with that. And I guess along with that is, you know, you may have 10 crashes on an intersection that has 5,000 vehicles and 10 crashes that might have 30,000 vehicles. And are you kind of differentiating what that impact is? Yes, uh, both excellent questions. I'll start with the second one. Um, traffic volume considerations did come up while we were developing this, and we have included a traffic volumes data layer as one of the supplemental data sets. Uh, we ultimately decided not to normalize any of the data based on traffic volumes, but we did provide that additional data set so that people could kind of visualize it for themselves. Um, but we decided it might be a little uh, confusing if we were doing that on the back end and not just presenting the raw data. Um, that is something we might reconsider in the future, but we did consider that, so thank you for that. And then as far as uh, like the impact of transportation improvement projects, is that, okay. Uh, we did also consider that. We currently do not have an ability to add a custom project. Um, however, that was part of the intention of having the temporal trends is that if you know when a transportation improvement project went in, you can check the previous year's data or the data for the year after if it's a few years ago and be able to kind of track some of those metrics and you will be able to filter the data down to, like I said earlier, a specific road corridor, for example, where the project went in. So again, it's kind of user driven. We haven't done anything on the back end, 
Um, but we we're doing our best to provide the tools to be able to do that for yourself. So you'll have to do that calculation outside of, okay, this is the improvement that we're doing based on trend or the type of accidents that we're having. And then yes, for now. And then um, at some point, uh, again, we would like to reassess whether we can add custom projects. So Dr. Cog has another web product called the uh, tip data tool, and that does allow for custom uh, project locations or um, borders to be put in and then assess data based on those. So at some point, maybe we would like to add that functionality, but as of yet, uh, it's kind of user driven. Oh, thank you, because I asked that question because that's a question that comes out of the tip applications of what benefits do you get? Hey, Clinch. Thank you, Chair, and thank you, Greg, for your presentation. Really appreciate it. So at Unincorporated Douglas County, we went through a similar exercise back in 2022, and we found it very beneficial. Um, my question is, will Dr. Cog, as part of the application process, will Dr. Cog require the use of this tool or accept local agency tools if they're of, of similar design and similar methods? I, I don't uh, know of any plans as of yet to require it. Okay, I'll lean on Todd for a for concrete answer. <laughs> there we go, that's a very good question. Um, we haven't made those types of decisions yet, um, getting down into whether it'd be required or not. Um, historically, we have had we've provided access to this data before i think this tool makes it 10 times as user friendly because in the past we would just point you to the data catalog and say here go run your analysis when we introduced the tape the the tip data tool we sort of started that process for you <clears throat> this kind of continues to that next level so there's all these tools that will be available to a tip applicant um, and again, we haven't got into the, the granular level of detail to say what would be required, what would not. But again, I think at a minimum, there's now an additional access to even more data than there was historically. Michelle Riccio? Yeah, just want to say thanks. This is, has been an awesome tool. Adams County has been using this out in Strasburg for some planning updates we're doing in-house. So this has been great to get to existing conditions like really quickly. Awesome, that is great to hear. Jennifer Hillhouse? Yes, I agree. Um, having this data will help us understand from a real perspective the trends and really appreciate even the Vision Zero plan that went into this um, I, we can just see one question kind of building upon your question. Um, I think that was a great one. We use, as you know, different data catalog uh, to update our own dashboard through DBD, which is much, it's on, it's on demand, right? We get it on a daily basis. And um, so it's really important for us to uh, appreciate this, right? Understands trends and where we're going and where um, we need to adapt. Um, but I guess it would just be those considerations on tip of, making sure that we can utilize our own data um, or working with us, I guess, as those requirements change. Um, and maybe even, uh, I, I appreciate your disclaimers that you have within the tool. That might be another one. We get that question a lot, you know, City and County of Denver, why is the data different from what CDOT's reporting out? And so maybe just putting it right up um, where everybody has access to it and data comes in a minute. But thank you very much. I mean, and you've, Taken it so many, um, so much further than we have. I love your little icons and so things that we can learn to bring it into our. Thank you. Yeah, um, thank you. So, um, to your point, uh, Jen, that's a really good point. And one of the premises for our regional crash data consortium work that we've been undertaking the last two years is. Um, the reality that there are different types of crash data 
um, that are available to jurisdictions um, that are used in different ways at different times from different sources for different purposes, right? Um, and we have found it difficult to kind of standardize crash data across the region and not sure that that's exactly needed per se, but for this crash data dashboard, it's being fed by the geolocating and the crash data that we process at a regional level. So it is a consistent data set across the region. However, it's also true that a jurisdiction like the city and county of Denver can go to your local law enforcement almost in real time and kind of, you know, feed into your own um, sort of crash data that you have available. Other jurisdictions are able to do that too. We'd like to get there as a region. We are on that journey, but um, that's going to be very difficult across the region or across the state. Um, but we appreciate those distinctions. At Norman. Uh, thank you. Uh, I think this is very good. Um, one uh, building a little off of what David said, I, I think it would be important to know whether it's arterials or collectors, especially at intersections. I know in the past when I was doing analysis and I was in a public meeting, it was nice to know if I have an arterial to arterial, I can expect a, a, an average number of crashes. I, I hate to say that, but you, d you do. And then is this above the norm or not? And then from a system-wide level and region-wide level, it'd be nice to know, hey, we had an average in 2024 of 15 crashes on an arterial to arterial intersection, and five years later, we now have crashes at 10 crashes. So are we making a systemic improvement towards our vision zero? Uh, so I, I think it'd be nice if there'd be a way to incorporate that base map from your regional transportation plan into that. Um, and, and I know we don't, a crash is a crash and an injury and a fatality or a fatality, but there's also the rates that, that some look at too. And um, so as you reconsider that just, it, it might be nice to have a, the ability to at least ask the rate. It might have to be an additional question, do you want to see rates or something? But. Um, um, from Vision Zero standpoint, yeah, we don't want to have any fatalities or serious crashes. But it, again, are we making improvements to the whole system? So, but I, I think this is great that what you've got there. And my only other question is, and maybe it's Doug that needs to answer it, but or C dot, have you had any more luck on getting the data quicker from the Department of Revenue uh, so that you can have more up to date data? Uh, data. I know that that's always been a contention. Well, I'll defer to our very capable CDOT representative. Thanks, Ken. <laughs> I asked that question last time this topic came up. It was probably like six or seven months ago, and it, it just takes a long time to get the data through the system. It's a lot of reconciliation between different data layers. I mean, I know I wake up in the morning and I have a text message that says, oh, there was a fatal. So that's fast, right? And then it takes a long time. So um, since the questions come up twice, maybe we'll have CDOT. Um, it goes through our headquarters. So maybe we'll have someone come and talk about kind of the journey that the data makes from when it comes in the door to being able to be put in the database. I will assist our very capable CDOT representative in answering that question because we've had that question for at least the last two years. Um, again, referring back to our regional crash data consortium work, and I'm going to lean on Eric to help me out with this answer, but that is one of the key things that we've looked at. I mean, the, the harsh truth is that crash data takes longer in its journey in Colorado than it does in, other, in some other states around the country. It varies across the country. Uh, places like Wisconsin and some others, it's almost instantaneous um, that it's available for analysis. Um, in other states, it takes a lot longer. So that is not to cast blame or to cast aspersion. Um, some of it is legislative, frankly. Um, processes are the way they are for a reason. Um, in this case, the Department of Revenue is the custodian of record for crash data. That's not true in every state. Other states, the data flows differently, so it is what it is here. Um, but through the Statewide Traffic Records Advisory Council, STRAC, um, and through other means, um, there has been um, a coordinated effort to try and improve the timeliness of crash data, um, but there is not an easy solution or we would have done it already. Um, but there are a lot of folks who are working on that issue and seeing what we can do through technology, um, through human resources, through other means um, to get that crash data more quickly because it is, frankly, a barrier to all of us in terms of our ability to understand uh, what's happening in the region and in the state. 
um, as part of the regional crash data consortium work, Eric actually charted out um, the journey of crash data in this state. It's it's like this flow chart that's almost incomprehensible, um, but I think he was the first person or one of the first in the state to actually put together that entire journey. So Eric, I'd lean on you if there's more you'd want to say to that, but just want to acknowledge the work that you're doing and others are doing to try and get us to a better place there. All right, thank you, Jacob. Yeah, the, yeah, the reality is that really the data is coming in from different um, agencies and different forums using different software, using different hardware at times to collect it, and different um, procedures and policies. So it's kind of coming into the state system in, in different ways that require different processing. And so I will actually be here next month to talk more about um, kind of the conclusion of the two-year period of our crash data consortium um, 405C grant. And getting into that, we did publish just last month our um, final report for that pro program, including a number of recommendations for how we can do that. And chief among that, I believe, is really moving, yeah, kind of standardizing that input process, um, whether that's through a single application or um, vetting different applications that might kind of move the data in a higher quality state initially to the two Department of Revenue and then to Department of Transportation so that it doesn't need to be processed so much, so that the, the good work that's being done by the DOR, by CDOT, um, by law enforcement, frankly, because sometimes it's a limitation that is not even an issue of the officer trooper. Sometimes it's the software that they have. Sometimes it is things that happen as the data is transmitted. Um, those are all things that we've learned through engaging with CDOT, DOR, law enforcement, and um, our local governments. And so great opportunity to move, to move that along, and I think that we'll be hopefully having a quicker turnaround of data um, as we move, move through the next few years. Thank you for those thorough answers. Um, Doug Rex? Thank you, Madam Chair, very much. I, I just wanted to add on to the, the conversations we've had re regarding the use of this tool for, uh, for TIP purposes or other um, application solicitation stuff. Um, I think, in, at least in my opinion, um, that this tool, as in all of the tools that we produce at Dr. Cog, are additive. And, um, you know, so while uh, there, there may be communities that have the resources available and have a better, better system or a system they feel more comfortable using and being able to query off whatever they need to query off, I think that's great. But there are a lot of communities within our region, of course, that don't have those resources. And I think this is a very powerful tool specifically for them to be able to use that. But ultimately, you know, it's not Dr. Cog's staff that gets to make that determination with regards to what data is used in, the, in our, our TIP application and the like. Um, that, of course, that recommendation would ultimately come from the Technical Advisory Committee and then our Transportation Advisory Committee and then up to the board that makes the final determination. So. Even if we were to suggest something like that, you'll all have a shot at it before it gets to the board level. Thank you, Madam Chair. Additional questions or comments? Thank you for that overview. And I, I just wanted to mention that I really appreciate Dr. Cog's staff. Uh, Broomfield's in the process of creating our own crash map, and Dr. Cog's staff has been really responsive and, and really helpful in that technical process. So appreciate the support in providing technical guidance to local agencies. Absolutely, yeah, and if anyone needs any advice for their own jurisdictions or organizations, we're happy to talk shop. Much appreciated. Seeing no other questions or comments, we'll move on to the next agenda item. Thank you, Greg. We'll move on to item number eight, 2050 Metro Vision Regional Transportation Plan, major update kickoff. This is a tech. F in your packet, and this will be presented by Alvin Vidal Sanchez, Regional Transportation Planning Program Manager. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you, Chair. Uh, so as introduced, we'll be discussing what is our kickoff to our next major four-year update to our regional transportation plan. Um, I'm going to run through what some of the high-level deliverables are for this upcoming update, high-level schedule, some of the immediate next steps we're looking at as staff to have um, with our partners in the region. But before I get into that, I want to kick us off with a video.
Well, now. All right. Just wanted to set the stage, maybe a little livelier with our conversation this afternoon. Um, a lot of what was heard in that video doesn't change in between our major four-year updates. Um, our regional transportation plan is about setting our region's investment priorities over the next 20 to 30 years, and we do it all together. Uh, for those who have been with Dr. Cog for a number of years, you'll recognize a version of this framework. The Regional Transportation Plan is one way that we implement Metro Vision, which is our shared vision for the future. There are two pieces to the Regional Transportation Plan. One, as alluded to in the video, is it is fiscally constrained. So what do we anticipate um, we can afford over the next 20 to 30 years, but it also has a vision component. What do we need over the next 20 to 30 years? And then just as the Regional Transportation Plan implements Metro Vision, the Transportation Improvement program implements the regional transportation plan. Some of these I uh, touched on in the video, you've heard me already verbally discuss, I'll only highlight a couple of them. Um, it is a multimodal vision for the region, so if you open it up, you will see all the different ways people move throughout the region, walking, biking, rolling, um, transit, motor vehicles, as well as the different ways freight moves through our region. It's also setting up what are our region's uh, policies as an agency in terms of complete streets, regional vision zero, micromobility. Um, I'm going to emphasize it is fiscally constrained when you do open up our RTP. Uh, every line on a map, dot on a map, row in a spreadsheet, we do believe uh, we can complete over the next 20 to 30 years with funding that is available over the next 20 to 30 years. We've highlighted the tip, um, any major road capacity or transit capacity project that uh, wants to be eligible for funding in the TIP needs to first be in the RTP. Be updated every four years. Um, that may seem like a lot, but if you're thinking we just discussed the RTP, I will highlight that we did just discuss the RTP. Uh, and then we do it with all of our partners in the region. So local member governments, CDOT, RTD, the Regional Air Quality Council, E470, um, the other toll authorities in the region, the airport. So uh, we work with all of our partners here. So like I mentioned, um, we do update it every four years, but in between we do provide an opportunity to amend the plan as we call it, so cycle amendments. Um, we do recognize needs change occasionally in between that four-year cycle, so we do provide an opportunity to make some targeted revisions to projects. We just closed out one of those processes. So the regional transportation plan that we're currently working with was adopted in September of 2022. That was to meet the state's greenhouse gas uh, planning standard. Um, that followed a two-year-long process to update the plan that was adopted in 2021. One. And then we most recently amended it in May of 2024. The RTP this last cycle, um, as all do, roll up all the different work that's been completed in the region from all of our different partners, federal, state, regional, local. So we're taking into account all the different needs and priorities that have been expressed in a lot of different plans here in the Denver region and how can the RTP continue those conversations or set a new framework for those. This last cycle, there were a few new types of projects in the Regional Transportation Plan. The top two have always been in our RTP, Roadway Capacity, Rapid Transit Capacity Projects. The last four have also been in our Regional Transportation Plan, maybe just a little differently. Uh, but this last cycle, we did do a particular solicitation to ask for these spe specific types of projects to include in our fiscally constrained list. That way, when folk in the region, stakeholders in the region are opening up our plan, they're going to see a lot of different types of projects, not just roadway capacity or transit capacity projects in our spreadsheets and on our maps. We established six priorities through that process. Uh, one actually came um, out through conversations with this body two years ago, um, maintaining efficient movement of goods within and through the, beyond the region. So freight was an added priority during this uh, development cycle two years ago. But we do have these six priorities that we developed last cycle that we ended up tagging investment to to make a little uh, easier for folk in the region to understand how we're making progress on each of these different priorities um, and the funding that's behind each of those. So some of these um, new for us as a region, a regional bus rapid transit program as an example, 1.2 billion of fiscal constrained dollars in the plan going towards that investment. Safety projects, um, these are specific safety projects. These aren't roadway projects, operational projects with a safety component. These are um, your bread and butter safety projects. That was new for us in the RTP to show specific projects like that with our fiscal constraint. So we took those priorities and started to tag investment in them as we developed our previous regional transportation plan. I say all that to set the stage that we've spent almost three years developing a 2050 regional transportation plan. Hopefully we've gotten a lot of it correct, but we know that we're, there will always be targeted revisions, enhancements that we can do during a four-year update cycle. Uh, like I mentioned, we did, did, did just wrap up a cycle amendment process. So if you're feeling we just 
adopted an RTP. We did just adopt an RTP. That was May of this year. Uh, we got federal approval back in July. But these things take some time. So we're anticipating two years to make the next regional transportation plan. This uh, needs to be due winter of 2026, have federal approval from our federal highway partners, federal transit partners. And just as with our amendment cycle, it still has to meet every requirement and more that we have in place as a metropolitan planning organization. Um, the state's greenhouse gas emission reduction standards continue to be in place. And so we still need to meet all of those different pieces around fiscal constraint, air quality modeling, public and stakeholder review, accessibility remediation. And so uh, we're expecting two years to get through this process. And we're starting the conversation with you all today. Some major activities that we're going to be undertaking during this effort include uh, an enhanced equity analysis that we would like to test out um, to inform the project solicitation investment selections that are part of the RTP. Continue scenario planning. Um, that'll be the next item is getting some thoughts from you on what do you think is uh, impacting growth and mobility in the region the most. Uh, we will have a solicitation and evaluation of projects in some form over the next two years. Obviously, engagement opportunities, I'm um, still figuring out what that looks like over the next two years, and then making sure all of our documents and materials are accessible. Looking at it from a schedule level, uh, we will be starting uh, externally the conversations on scenario planning with the next item that is uh, before y'all this afternoon, but we started to have those conversations internally. Um, we anticipate that uh, continuing through into next year, into spring of next year. Uh, another major task is financial planning. We need to make sure that we're taking into account all of the different funding that we think will be spent on transportation in the region. So our funding, CDOT funding, RTD, local member government, toll authority, potential discretionary grants. Um, so how do we take into account all of that and what's actually available for us to put on projects when it comes time to prioritize what are our investments for the region? Like I mentioned, a candidate project solicitation and evaluation phase of some sort, still figuring out what that looks like, and part of that will be a conversation with y'all. But summer, late summer, is when we anticipate that solicitation phase for projects in the regional transportation plan, and then that will lead us into our required modeling that we have to do for air quality, uh, federal air quality conformity, and the state's greenhouse gas transportation planning standard. All throughout that, we're going to be updating our document. Um, we have our main document, about 200 pages. Uh, we have 19, 24 appendices, depending on how you count those, a number of different ancillary resources like web maps, our TRIPS database, so making sure those are being updated concurrently as appropriate as well. Ongoing public and stakeholder engagement, we anticipate having a public stakeholder review uh, the second quarter of 2026, and then coming back before the committees and the board uh, fall for action on the actual regional transportation plan adoption. Um, obviously, we will have more touch points with y'all than today and two years from now, but at least a high level, we anticipate coming back before y'all for action um, late 2026. In addition to those major activities, there's just a whole bunch of other work that's also going on. So we still have to show um, annual mitigation action plan uh, reporting for the state's GHG planning standards, so we continue to do that annually. There are some tasks that we've been calling definitions tasks. So like Jacob mentioned, uh, we do anticipate having a public engagement plan that's specific to the RTP, who we want to engage, how do we want to engage, when do we want to engage, um, and also being cognizant that we're engaging a lot already at Dr. Cog, so how can we leverage some of those existing opportunities through the active transportation plan, the decarbonization effort, um, the housing needs assessment work that's occurring. So where can we plug in where needed or um, have separate events, separate opportunities where possible. Uh, the regional roadway system, um, I'll touch on before we leave this presentation, uh, but the network that is made up of roadways in the region that uh, create eligible projects in our regional transportation plan and in the transportation improvement program, I always know a hot topic, um, will be something that we set early on in this two-year process as well, so having a solicitation, what should be on that network uh, for eligible projects in the plan. I mentioned an equity analysis. Uh, we do have a new equity index here at the region. Um, I guess I really can't really say new. It's been two years, but we piloted it with the TIP, and we want to try it out with the RTP. What does that look like on the front end if we're testing equity with the projects that are currently in the plan, and how does that inform the solicitation next year? We want to confirm what we call existing plus committed projects, so projects we need to show in the plan but aren't using a fiscal constraint. So no funding in the plan, but not open yet to traffic, essentially. And then vision projects, what do we need in the region that we just can't afford with the resources that are available to us? 
then I touched on the financial planning task already, but that second bullet point, uh, project versus program allocation. A lot of the money in the region is already called for in other projects and other programs um, in, in debt service. Um, so how do we make sure that the funding that is available to projects um, is being prioritized for the most important needs here in the Denver region? So I mentioned I would touch on this before the conversation uh, with this presentation closed, our regional roadway system. Um, this layer is available through the Dr. Cog data tool. I hope everyone has been able to find it as one of the multiple layers in that data tool. But it is the network of um, roadways that are eligible for projects in our regional transportation plan and our transportation improvement program um, for, for roadway projects. Um, but this is the network that we will be coming back before uh, our local governments, our local partners to set over the next two years, uh, should there be additions to this network, revisions to the network, um, eliminations, deletions from this network that's no longer a priority for the region, for any particular communities. And so this network is what we'll be discussing over the next uh, couple months to set to make sure that we're being uh, appropriate with the project solicitation phase that we have planned for the RTP. Um, I'll start uh, closing out by noting that a lot's changed since 2020. Um, I'll be touching on population and employment forecasts in the next item, but uh, we do anticipate still being a growing region, just maybe not as fast as previously anticipated. There are new federal and state financial resources available to us as a region. Um, we were pretty aggressive in the last regional transportation plan with um, financial assumptions coming to the region. So how does it actually uh, compare with what we're seeing, and do we still need to be even more aggressive to meet the priorities and goals that we're setting for ourselves? There's been progress on a regional bus rapid transit partnership here in the region, um, so are there potential revisions there through that work? There's just a whole host of new plans that exist that didn't exist four years ago. A new TDM strategic plan, the regional transportation operations and technology strategic plan, a new regional housing needs assessment. So how can we leverage all of those in the next two-year update cycle? And then we do have some ongoing updates to other plans. Uh, like I mentioned, how can we leverage some of the engagement through those efforts, through our efforts? What can we learn through the active transportation plan update, the multimodal freight plan update, and how can we make sure those are timely for us? And I'll close out with next steps. We have uh, provided notice to our uh, regional partners, CDOT and CDPHE, uh, to officially kick off this process with them. We're going to continue exploring the scenario analysis that's available to us this cycle. That'll be this next item where we're going before y'all and asking some of y'all's thoughts. We do want to provide some deliverable specific updates when appropriate. So the regional roadway system, the project definitions, the equity analysis, what makes sense for the RTB this next cycle. We want to do some outreach to partners on financial planning, um, so making sure we have the best available forecasts from our partners, um, CDOT, RTD, locals. And then continuing coordination with CDOT on their own statewide plan update effort, making sure we're aligned where possible, um, having a consistent message in the region on how both plans work together. Um, and I was remiss in not including a question slide, so this is unfortunately the last slide, but uh, Chair, that concludes my presentation. Thank you, Alvin. Are there any questions for Dr. Cog's staff about the MetroVision Regional Transportation Plan update? Yes, Zeke Lynch. Thank you, Chair. Um, and Alvin, thank you very much for your presentation. Um, as a local agency, we're embarking on our own 2050 Transportation Plan update. So I really have two questions. One, the first is, how can local agencies be most effective as a better proceed the Dr. Cog regional planning process or follow that process? And then the second is, how can local agencies help Dr. Cog through this process to ensure that, you know, especially the local land use is properly reflected? We're, we're so reliant on Dr. Cog and the modeling efforts in particular. It's hugely important to our transportation planning on the local. Well, that's a great question. There are a number of efforts, um, uh, even just internally, that are happening that we want to make sure we're aligned with as much as possible. Um, I wouldn't say one or the other is preferable. Um, in terms of a plan that might be preceding the regional transportation plan, I think there are maybe just some milestones that we'd want to keep in contact with. Uh, the big one I can think of is just being that project solicitation phase. So uh, we anticipate that being summer or late summer of 2025. Where are you in potentially your other plans, not just your comprehensive plans, but your own other modal plans, priorities? That that you're setting for a community, how can that build into a future solicitation phase here that we lead through the regional transportation plan? Um, and, and then in terms of, of 
afterwards. Um, we do already have our adopted regional transportation plan. Uh, we don't anticipate drastic changes to the overall structure. This won't be a, um, an overhaul as the 2040-2050 effort was. This more is a targeted refinement um, revision to the RTP effort. So um, I wouldn't say that the current RTP um, is by any means um, no longer applicable. I lost the one word for that. And then, um, sorry, in terms of the land use side, um, that will be um, a, a separate conversation uh, that uh, we do do uh, a separate effort around small area forecasts and working with our partners. So um, that, that will be something done in conjunction with you all later in this process. Galvin, any additional questions or comments? Matt Callison. Yeah, thank you, Madam Chairman. Uh, question, thank you for the presentation now. Um, we all are anxious to, to take this journey with you. City of Aurora is in the process of, of uh, conducting a multi. We're actually going into the thanks. We're actually going into the uh, scenario planning process now, uh, recognizing the the strong linkage between transportation and land use. So, one a follow up question relative to land use assumptions in small area forecasts and and reconciling those throughout the community, particularly high growth. Uh, the second question is how do we how do we best interface uh, moving forward uh, with the regional transportation system you roadway system we have the influx of the BRT uh, efforts that are region wide and they certainly influence uh, moving forward in the future in terms of what local jurisdictions are uh, recognizing and uh, Advancing in terms of land use density and intensity, uh, as as well as other transportation, like ped access and uh, I did notice your your area planning schedule looked like it was coming just just either before or after the regional trans. So, I'm answer. Uh, yeah, so I think the, the regional roadway city. system effort will be in some ways concurrent with the scenario analysis effort. Um, our, our scenario analysis work is typically more larger what-if questions, um, and so we don't rely on historically particular investments of projects to test. It's more um, larger, um, larger questions um, that we've done regional testing with before, but in this next item we can see maybe different geographies more appropriate for that. Um, in terms of, of land use, that might be a more appropriate response in the next item, um, unless Jacob or Doug would like to touch on how that, that fits in to this effort um, at this stage with just the kickoff. Yeah, I mean, I can say a couple words on it now. We will discuss it in the next item with scenario planning, but in the big picture, it's actually a federal requirement. We would do it anyway, but it's a federal requirement that we um, that we show our socioeconomic sort of assumptions, our land use and growth assumptions as part of our regional plan and as part of that effort. Obviously, it's a big input into our focused travel model. So our um, regional planning and development team has been and will continue to be working with local governments in terms of those growth forecasts. Now, whether it's land use or even transportation or the regional roadway system or transit planning or whatever it may be, we are sort of operating at different scales here. And I do want to make clear, we are we are well aware and actually participating with several of you on your local plans, um, and we appreciate the opportunity to do so. The regional transportation plan may not directly exactly kind of roll up all of those local plans, you know, one for one, but we want to capture the big picture ideas. We want to capture the major priorities that are coming from that work. But for example, in your local planning, you will define a more robust roadway system. You may define more robust lane use assumptions than we would typically carry at the regional level. So it's not sort of identical. It's more about consistency, but we do want to capture those major efforts um, and those assumptions together as a region as we go forward into the regional planning process. Does that sort of address your question, Max? It'll be a work in progress, it sounds like, in, in terms of how we can best move forward and for success, ensuring the BRT uh, network is successful moving forward, ensuring that investments uh, and advances in transit programs and outreach to our most vulnerable communities, to the areas uh, that have been underinvested historically. 
but I am glad uh, you brought up their equity. Thank you, Chair. Yeah, there will be, we promise, a very robust process um, that we will all work together to revisit the um, project priorities, the investment priorities that are in the current plan um, and a level of, of sort of engagement around solicitation of how those priorities will change over time. So that is coming. You will get sick of us um, by the end of the next two years. David Kreitzing. Thank you. Um, great presentation. Um, for the financial planning, on. Uh, Dr. Cog to continue to out to some non-traditional partners in the Forest Service and look for a federal lands access program. Pressures on our recreation systems throughout the, the foothill communities. To that point, thank you for that, David. Um, we are actually a stakeholder and participant on the state transportation environmental resource Council, I think I got that right, the Turk um, that many of you also participate in. Um, and actually, we will be hosting the next Turk meeting in February at Dr. Cog, by the way, early plug for that. Um, but to your larger point, David, um, yes, that's a very, very important point um, and a good consideration of um, bringing in that environmental perspective and those financial um, perspectives into the overall uh, long range planning process. We appreciate that. Thank you. Matt Mormon. Uh, um, yeah, I think you've got a good start, Alvin, and I, I know it's a long road having gone through this before with you. Um, one of my questions is, is, is that our board seems to be really focused on housing. How will you marry the housing and transportation elements together, or have you thought that out yet? Is that a t to be decided? <laughs> I think it's a, a both to be decided, but also uh, we've, we've been in the land use space in some way before with previous regional transportation plans. Our most recent uh, scenario analysis did look at that housing distribution question. Uh, what if we do grow differently? So I would say we have been having some of those conversations in some form um, in the past, if, even if not explicitly in the, the housing assessment realm. realm. Um, and this last, uh, last scenario analysis cycle uh, really informed um, the types of projects we ended up going out for this last last time. So we can see um, with these new deliverables, the regional housing needs assessment, what could we ask new this time? How could we um, potentially place projects differently in the region? And just to follow up, um, will water availability be a, a decision in your small area forecasting? Uh, I, I'm afraid I do not know the response to that question in particular. Um, I will say in terms of the regional transportation plan, we do want to be more um, lean into resilience more than maybe we have in, in the previous couple cycles. Um, so a potential new uh, content narrative sections, uh, maybe in the solicitation phase, asking some different questions around effort, efforts of resilience um, and water availability could play into that. Thanks. Uh, I just want to expand upon Kent's question a little because we're a lot of communities that I know in Boulder County are dealing with a new DOD density requirements and not having the available water for that. So probably having to documentation to scale that back a bit. So I think it's just a question uh, in my mind and I'm guessing some others how that work will tie into this. Uh, that you have to answer that today, but just for future reference. No, it's a great question, and there are folk in the room uh, who will be uh, working on our, our small area forecasts um, that I know we're listening into, so we'll, we'll follow up on that. Additional questions or comments? Great. Well, now that we're officially kicked off, we'll move on to the next agenda item, number nine, which is the 2050 Regional Transportation Plan Scenario Planning Introduction. And Alvin will lead this presentation. All right, so um, I'm going to be touching on uh, 
three aspects of this scenario work. One is just a recap of what we did last cycle. Um, a reminder for folks who might not recall four years ago or for new folk. Um, touch on what we're seeing with the latest population and employment forecast for the region and what impacts that could have on travel in the region. And then we'd like to close out with a Mentimeter exercise, asking you all what you think the most important um, impacts uh, in the region are that are going to impact growth and mobility here that we could potentially test for during this next scenario analysis cycle. Uh, so like I mentioned, you've already seen this schedule. Uh, we've already started having internal conversations on what the scenario work could look like. I'm um, taking into account what we did last cycle, where can we grow this analysis this year? Um, like I mentioned, we do anticipate um, coming, um, closing out this, this scenario planning effort um, spring, early summer of 2025. And then uh, that will help inform what our candidate solicitation project process looks like next year. So I'll start with a recap of our 2020 scenarios analysis. Um, this is a whole appendix in the Regional Transportation Plan. I invite you all to go explore that. When we first presented these findings almost four years ago, I believe it was a 70-slide presentation. So this is going to be very high level, very quick, um, but hopefully some points that uh, we took to revise our Regional Transportation Plan. A recognition we're a growing region. We expect to stay a growing region. We also have a pretty extensive transportation system already here in the Denver region. 36 state highways, 4,000 signalized intersections. Uh, we're both growing and pretty well established as a region. When it comes to scenarios for Dr. Cog, I know we all do those a little differently, but here these were really big what if questions. We all always hear, well, if we just did this, we would solve mobility in the region. So we wanted to test some of that last cycle. These were relative comparisons, so they weren't rigorous. We weren't choosing a scenario to pick projects out of. Um, I know some scenario analysis, there is a investment mix that you test, and then depending on uh, different outcomes, you might go forward with one particular investment mix. That was not what we did this last cycle. It really was just about seeing what happens if we put everything in one bucket for the next 20 to 30 years. We wanted to see what some of those choices and trade-offs were in the region. Um, do transit trips go up and bike pet trips go down? Um, are we okay with that? And then we wanted some guidance as we moved later into the regional transportation plan development on um, guidance and direction on what should we be including in the plan, what questions should we be asking. So we had two land use scenarios, five transportation scenarios. We also did some combinations of those. Uh, specifically, we combined an infill scenario with the travel choices scenario and a center scenario with the transit scenario. Um, off peak congestion um, was interstate widening in particular areas and some intersection improvements, interchange improvements. Uh, managed lanes and operations built out a managed lanes network across our region. Travel choices uh, increased bicycle and pedestrian op options throughout our region and um, increased telework. And then transit built out fast tracks, built out a bus rapid transit network, doubled transit service, and made transit free. Uh, and then infill uh, focused some development around, I believe, 12% of the region's land area, and centers focused development around 3% of the region's land area. The next three slides are all built the same way, 2020, where we were back then, 2050, where we thought we were going without any further investments or changes to the transportation or um, land use networks, and then the following three uh, are what those transportation scenarios actually looked like in terms of outcomes. These are all compared to our MetroVision targets we've actually established in MetroVision. So uh, reducing daily vehicle miles traveled, none of our transportation scenarios um, meet our MetroVision targets of reducing daily VMT per capita. Same with our uh, reduced single occupancy vehicle mode share to work. Um, none of those transportation scenarios by themselves got us to our MetroVision target. Uh, but when you look at delay per capita, um, travel choices did decrease delay in the region, meeting our MetroVision target, um, and same with managed lanes and operations. Each of these had some different trade-offs, though. Um, so managed lanes and operations um, reduced delay but increased VMT, potentially. So are we okay with that as a region? Moving into uh, when we started to combine these, so infill and travel choices, um, what happens when we start having that, that uh, land use transportation connections conversation? When we combine both of those, there are 14.5 million vehicle miles traveled, um, a decrease of that each day compared to where we were in our 2050 baseline without further investments, twice as many walk by trips. Uh, this one was notable because there were more transit trips in this scenario than our transit scenario. And then looking at each of those uh, 
just in comparison, um, gray, 2050 base, where we thought we would be. Green was our travel choices scenario by itself, no other land use components. Orange, our infill scenario, no transportation components. And then blue, what happens when you pair those together? So seeing some significant um, synergy when you start to combine land use and transportation. And then the second combination I'll touch on is our centers and transit scenario. Um, these were focused on key centers and corridors, uh, think BRT corridors, rail stations, uh, and then with a very aggressive transit scenario, completing fast tracks, more rail than that, um, extensive BRT network, expanding service, and free fares. Uh, VMT decreased 24%. There were three times as many walk-bike trips, six times as many transit trips. Um, people and vehicles also just experienced less delay through this scenario. Um, there were more trips occurring compared to the 2050 base, uh, just because there's more time for shorter trips in the region. And then similar structure to the previous combination scenario, 2050 baseline in gray, green, our transit scenario by itself, orange, which is just a center's land use scenario, no other transportation investments. We're seeing pretty significant uh, reductions in VMT and increases in transit walk bike trips. And then when you really combine those, you see that continue. We took um, that and 60 slides more and thought, what could we change in the regional transportation plan? So you've seen this slide already, but the first two we've always included in the plan, we have to include in the plan um, roadway capacity, rapid transit capacity projects. But what we were seeing in our scenarios where what we've been hearing in the region is we want more types of projects, more ways to travel in the region. Um, and when you pair them with land use, you get some pretty significant uh, positive movement in particular metrics. And so uh, working with the TAC at the time, we developed a structure to increase the types of projects we were asking for in our solicitation phase. So everything below that dotted line, we specifically asked for um, as a specific project that would be a line item in a spreadsheet, a line on a map, a dot on a map. Um, they have always been in our plan in some form, but more as maybe buckets of projects. So you can never point to a line on the map and say that's a safety project. Um, coming out of that scenario work and what we were hearing through our engagement, uh, we wanted to be more intentional. So we expanded the types of projects that we asked for in the RTP. And like I mentioned, that led to a pretty significant investment in projects that we otherwise wouldn't have shown in the regional transportation plan this way. 465 million in safety projects, 180 million in active transportation. Um, I will note these are pre-GHG planning standard numbers. So I actually believe active transportation is now maybe 900 million projects going to active transportation projects specifically. Um, so through that scenario work, we were able to change our project mix um, and, and change, the, change what we're investing in. So with that, um, I'm going to move us over to our latest population and employment forecasts. Changes since our last scenario planning exercise uh, four or five years ago, um, we do expect a reduction um, from our 2050 original number by about 231,000 people. So we are still a growing region. Um, that should still be the message. We're just not growing as fast as we thought we might have been uh, four years ago. Uh, we have some uh, enhancements to the tools we use here at Dr. Cog, uh, so we're better able to represent the region's population in our models, um, specifically uh, aging in, in our model. And so uh, with these new forecasts and these enhancements to our tools, uh, we do, uh, you will see that there are some changes in age, income, and workers that we expect to impact trips in the region. So starting with just base population and employment forecast, um, we do expect 5.2% fewer people by 2050 compared to four years ago. Um, so fewer, fewer folk in the region, fewer trips in the region. Same thing on the job side, 7.1% fewer jobs compared to where we were expecting four years ago. Um, obviously with fewer jobs, also fewer commute trips. So already um, the trips that will be coming out of our model are a little different and fewer than what we were expecting four years ago. Um, but still, to be clear, we are a growing region. 800,000 people is not something to not plan for, not um, be excited for. When it comes to age changes, this is where you're going to see some pretty significant um, changes from four years ago, just with the enhancements we've been able to add to our models. Um, I'll cycle through each of these so you can see them uh, all together. Uh, but fewer children. Uh, Fewer working age adults, um, but a pretty significant increase in older adults in the region. So that's uh, just being captured by better ways we're able to model age in our model. 
workers per household, um, as there are more older adults in the region, there are more households with no workers. Um, there could be households with uh, one households with one worker have decre decreased. Um, and so as as we're changing the makeup age wise of the population in our models, we're seeing how that impacts other other aspects of trips that are occurring in the region. Oh, and then um, 43.5% additional households with no workers. So just reflecting that um, larger, larger older adult population. And we're also able to get income data out of our models as well. Um, in this case, you're seeing a decrease in household income for uh, 70,000 to 150,000 or more than 150,000. We know those households take different kinds of trips, um, travel differently. So we can expect those trips in the model to also be potentially different. Uh, auto ownership in our model to be a little different with these uh, different types of households now being reflected more appropriately in our model. So looking at a summary of those population and employment changes, um, by 2050, we do expect 231,000 fewer residents than what we were thinking four years ago, 212,000 fewer jobs, um, 130,000 additional households with no worker. Um, you can also break that down by age and income. Um, so more older adults really is one of the, the larger key points that we're gonna drive home here um, related to our our scenario work, but just larger planning in the region, and then fewer working age adults, fewer children, and all of these are compared to the previous 2050 forecast. So um, not compared to today, but compared to 2050, four years ago. So knowing all these uh, different changes are gonna be reflected in our models, what does that actually do to trips that we're seeing in the region? Uh, we do expect fewer person trips across all modes, fewer vehicle trips, fewer transit trips, and fewer bike pet trips. So um, for each of these, as there are less workers, uh, there are more older adults, there are less people in the region. They're traveling differently. Um, they're traveling less than what we were expecting uh, four years ago for our 2050 forecasts. And so this results in fewer vehicle miles traveled in the region, um, a slight decrease in VMT per capita, uh, and a decrease in delay as well for the region. So um, what this means for our scenario planning effort and, and the RTP process, um, our new 2050 baseline just has a smaller population compared to where we were four years ago. That means there's also lower traffic congestion than what we were anticipating four years ago. Uh, our model does behave differently, um, but we do think it's a better real world representation of, of people in the region. Um, so while uh, we'll, we'll always want to compare to the previous uh, scenario cycle, there are um, just some differences. That means we can't be directly comparable, just knowing we have better tools to cycle and the forecasts themselves are different. And then um, we'll close out with, we do want to get some conceptual feedback before we open up for conversation, uh, but hear from y'all, what do you think are the, the most important impact to growth and mobility in the region? We've been having our own internal conversations. What can we test this? for this next two year cycle uh, for scenario analysis. Um, and so we wanna hear from y'all what that potentially could be to have that start, start to have that conversation. And then we'll be coming back before y'all to um, gain uh, concurrence with what we are defining as scenarios to test for this cycle. Thank you, Alvin. And then, oh, sorry, I'm gonna get a Mentimeter exercise pulled up real quick, sorry, Chair. believe the QR code's available. But so again, menti.com 9543-5108. So our first question, what demographic shifts uh, do you think are most likely to have significant impact on transportation needs in our region? Um, give away part of that answer, older adults growing population, but what else are you seeing in your communities? So 
post-COVID work from home trends. Lower transportation revenues, um, I assume that means just with fewer people than we were anticipating over the next 20, 30 years, just correlated lower transportation revenues. Fewer workers, specifically highway maintainers. Population shifts to northern Colorado. Remote work, okay. Seven more seconds. Here we go. Hybrid workers, density requirements, different commuting patterns, uh, shift to EV vehicles. Anything here being surprised? Anything here folk are surprised by? Right, well, I'm going to move us on to our more scooters, more e bikes. What emerging economic trends do you think could reshape transportation demand here in the region? E-bikes, home delivery. Autonomous buses. Density increases. Electrification, slower EV conversion, and rail expansion, remote growth again, continued growth in logistics, AI. Primary jobs versus retail, less retail. What technological advancements should we consider as potential game changers? autonomous vehicles, microtransit, very hot in the region right now with a number of studies that are ongoing. It seems a little slower, but I'll give it seven more seconds and we'll move on. Ability of service, drones, air coordination, electric vehicles. But changes in land use patterns are expected to influence transportation needs and infrastructure. Possible 24, 13, 13. Second, third, affordable housing, mixed use higher density, you'd increase density.
but environmental changes could pose new challenges. Um, like I mentioned, this was one that we maybe didn't lean too much into this last RTP cycle, but what are we seeing uh, resiliency-wise, environmental-wise, that we should be taking into account as we develop our next regional transportation plan? What could we potentially test for in our scenario analyses? Flooding, water availability, wildfire, heat, GHG budgets, climate change, electrical vehicles, interesting. What potential disruptions or emergencies should we consider to foster resilience in our region? Could be a Paired answer with the previous question. Apologies. Flooding, wildfires, similar responses to the previous question, lack of water, haze, evacuation routing, building affordability, power outages, Thank you all for chiming in. Um, I know that was pretty quick, but I also want to make sure that we have some space for uh, any verbal communication that folks would like to have before the meeting ends. So, uh, Chair, I will turn it back over to you. Thank you, Alvin. Any questions for Dr. Cogstaff about the scenario planning? David Gasper. Question, Alvin. Uh, with the um, the aging population, I think you showed 130,000 new households difference between the last projection and this one. Is that, is that a correct number? Uh, uh, by income or in, in general? Apologies. Yeah. Uh, retirees, essentially. My question is, I guess, is I was wondering if, if your model has enough nuance to show how well we're retaining the 65 plus population in, in this model compared to historic, historical trends. Because I know I understand we're all going to be getting we're we're going to get older as a region. I was just wondering how well we're competing with keeping our retirees here, opposed to them moving to Florida or Arizona or whatever, right? Um, I don't know the answer to that question. I know we do have just a better tool for aging now, so that could be captured a little bit with the enhancements that we have. But I think part of that question is also potentially um, like outside the scope of what we're able to capture with our land use model. Um, but I do also have some colleagues here that might be able to better answer that question um, or any of the technical modeling questions if they would like to come up and add to that. So I'll, I'll pause. Yeah, thank you for that question. I think in terms of competition, where that's, it's really going to be coming from the demography office forecast. And right now we're largely, or they're largely assuming in that forecast that the population is going to age in place. So we're not assuming like huge out migration of older adults to cheaper cost of living areas. But that is something realistically that could happen, you know, if the cost of living becomes too high. And that's maybe not something that's captured right now. And just to follow up on that, Alvin, or whoever, um, it, you mentioned that multiple times. I mean, we're, we're not growing as fast as we projected uh, five years ago, the last time we did this, but we're still growing. I mean, is it, for everyone else's sake, it's, it's fair to say that that's a trend across the entire country, right? As, as a country, we're not growing as fast as previous decades. Yes, I think that is a larger trend, and a lot of that is just uh, related to declines in fertility rates that are happening everywhere. Corey, if I may just add to that, um, we are still planning on 
our rate of growth is still higher than the national average, right? Correct. I will also note on the on the older adults front that um, we are we are currently the third fastest um, the third. How do we say that, Corey? How do you say it? The third fastest growing aging population by state, country, which surprises the heck out of me. I just you know you think of you know obviously Arizona, Florida, whatever else, but um, and there's some anecdotal reasons or as to why that might be, but um, but it's uh, but it's something that really we don't have a handle on, and I. We've, I'm sure there have been conversations about this in the past with regards to housing stock, right, and whether we're ready for that type of uh, demographic as we go forward in the future. I mean, we currently, households with no children, excuse me, households with children is going to remain virtually flat between now and the year 2050. Households with no children is, you know, the line is relatively steep. Um, so, yeah, so just just makes you pause and think about, you know, the type of house housing that we need to accommodate that type of growth. Jennifer Hillhouse. Oh, and I'm excited for this um, adventure with you. Um, we've been through something similar because we're great partners in our um, update to scenario planning. One thing I'm hoping that we could reconcile through this process is certainly DOLA, you know, estimates that we're going to see decrease national trend. Um, but when we think about, you know, DEN estimating 22% and employment, um, tourists, you know, coming, which have demand on our infrastructure, just how we reconcile that through this process in addition to our population. Thank you. 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 Thank are you assuming that we're going to keep the same type of transit that we have today, or are you looking to model the newer forms of transit, whether it be micro transit or, for instance, Colorado 7 Transit and some of these other BRTs that are going east west and instead of into downtown? Just curious, how, because I can see if you have fewer workers headed downtown because of the aging worker, you're going to have less transit that way, but. Um, I can't imagine, and, and, and Chris Quinn over there with RTD may have a better answer, but I would imagine as they look forward, they're now looking to see if that model still makes the most sense to get people around or, or add to it to, to make some additional east-west, north-south connections that maybe not go through downtown. So yeah. just asking how you came up with the 28% decrease. Yeah, so the, the 2050 forecast does take into account the regional transportation plan that we currently have. So the, the expanded transit options that are, are expected to be completed by 2050 through our current adopted RTP. Uh, when it comes to other modes that aren't like fixed route or um, um, rapid transit, I mean, those, those might be a little more difficult to model. Um, we learned a lot through this last scenario exercise in terms of the factors we're able to move in our travel model to reflect other types of, of trips. Um, but like micro transit itself might be a, a you, an interesting mode to try and test in our model. Um, it might not work maybe at the regional scale, but maybe we could try something at a, at a smaller geography. But that could be something we explore. Doug Rex. Madam Chair, thank you very much. Alvin, can you go to that slide, that the one that Ken was referring to? Because there is a lot on that slide. Um, not that. Yeah, this one. So I'm trying to understand exactly what this is telling me. So the 28% fewer transit trips, is that based on what we were pro what we were projecting in our last plan because of the reduction in population forecast that the assumption is 28% fewer transit trips would result from that reduction, right? It's not any additional modeling we've done on the on the new forecast. Right. It was just a simple, simple subtraction exercise, right? So I believe this was, uh, this is the 2050 with our current transportation investments with the latest population employment forecast compared to the, yeah, these are the, with the latest population employment, the, the decreased growth that we're expecting right. over the next okay. 20 to 30 years. So Alvin, just to be clear, another way of saying that, which, which you're showing on this slide is that we modeled 
the fiscally constrained 2050 regional transportation plan with the updated growth forecasts and the improvements to the model, and this is what resulted. So it's not that we've changed our plan or our priorities or the projects, it's that this is what it would have looked like if we had done this four years ago with, with the changes. Okay, got it. Yeah, I don't like that. <laughs> <laughs> FYI. <laughs> Uh, I, I think that clarifies it because you're using the same network and everything. That, that that was my question, so thank you. Alex Hyde, right? Uh, not to beat a dead horse, but that's not 28% fewer than today. It's 28% fewer in 2050 than we used to think it was going to be. Correct. Correct. All of these are compared to uh, the previous 2050 um, expectations. So. We are a growing region. We still expect to grow. We're just not growing as fast. And so with that reduction in growth, we do expect to see just fewer trips um, in general in our model in the region compared to where we expected 2050 to be four years ago. But next to all these numbers, what's not said is that compared to today, there are other percentages that show it's going to be this much more than it is today for all of these modes. Right. This is not compared to uh, a baseline of 2024 which will be something we um, do with our scenario analysis work. A lot of the last scenario analysis cycle was show you where, where we were in 2020, where we think we were going in 2050, and then what happens when we start making these pretty drastic changes in both of our models. Um, so a future 2024 baseline could be a data point to show here just to see where we are now, um, where we think we'll be in 2050, and then how that compares with where we thought we would be four years ago. But it is to make the point that our adopted fiscally constrained regional transportation plan, modeling it today with all the changes, with the updates, with the um, decreases in growth forecasts, this is what it looks like. So what does that tell us about the plan that we have and our priorities and how the plan should change moving forward? I mean, this is kind of our starting point. Additional questions or comments, Dr. Cox, staff? Thank you, Alvin. Thank you for kicking us off and the scenario planning. We look forward to having more conversations over the next few years. Thank you. That concludes the discussion items, and uh, we'll move on to member comments and other matters. Um, first, uh, Jacob, did you want to introduce? Yes, uh, we do have one new staff member on our transportation planning team, um, though she is not new to Dr. Cog, Mallory Miller, who is in the back. Mallory. Um, is our new senior planner and uh, project manager for our Ride Alliance Human Service Trip Exchange Hub. Um, this is the project for which we recently won, somewhat recently won, a SMART grant um, to implement this project. So Mallory will be um, undertaking that work. Uh, Mallory has been with us for, I think, three years um, and used to work in our area agency on aging. So we're really glad to have her on our side of the shop. Welcome, Mallory. There are no advanced mobility partnership working group updates this month. Are there any other updates from members or alternates? Doug? Madam Chair, thank you very much. I, I just wanted to share with you all, I had the opportunity to, um, to give a presentation to the Calgary Metropolitan Regional Board on Friday. Um, I was invited up there to speak to, they were a uh, relatively new regional council, six years old. Uh, up there to talk a little bit about how, how we do it here in the Denver region, as well as uh, a little bit of history about regional councils um, and lessons learned and all that kind of. God, I've been doing this 32 years I've been involved with regional councils. <laughs> God, I, it's ridiculous when I say it out loud. But anyway, I, so the one thing that they really seemed to be intrigued about was the, the, the Transportation Advisory Committee, the technical aspects of the discussion um, before it ever gets to the board level, right? And I had multitude of questions specifically about that because um, they don't have that. And quite frankly, they don't have federal legislation that kind of directs them about the process and all that kind of good stuff. So um, they are planning on implementing a technical advisory committee um, to help um, shape the conversations with their, with their board. So I just thought I would share that. Doug? Additional comments or updates from members or alternates? Wonderful. Um, let's see. We will be, uh, due to the holiday schedule, the next meeting will be moved up to November 18th, 2024. 
And if you did not sign in, uh, please check in at the check-in table or check in with Dr. Cog's staff to be registered as attending. We'll see you November 18th, 2024, and we are now adjourned at 3.37 p.m. Thank you.